I want to say happy Sabbath to each one. Yes, we know that when the sun set, we enter sacred time. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to have to de diverge from the, what the elder asked me to do. I want to get right into the message. Amen? Amen? And so we're not going to waste any time with that. We'll bring that. You can bring that up. And I want to thank Brother and Sister Norwood for their uh, invitation to us and for giving us this opportunity to worship together, study together, serve God together. And I believe that in just a little while Jesus is coming. Do you believe that? Amen. I want to go home with him, brothers and sisters. I do not want to be in this world more than I have to be. My friends, in just a little while, if we're faithful to Jesus, every one of us can spend an eternity with Christ. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we can be able to sit down at the welcome table with Jesus? It's going to be a wonderful time. What do you say? Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I believe that we are living in a day and hour where we're told that the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs is a revival and reformation. What did I say? Revival and reformation. Those are two different things. One has to do with spiritual life. It has to do with resurrection from the dead. And my brothers and sisters, we're told that the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs is a revival and reformation, and that to seek this should be our first work. Now, my question is, can we receive revival without Jesus? No, we can't do that. The Bible says over the rent grave of, uh, of Lazarus that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he was dead, yet shall he live. Without Jesus, we cannot experience revival. But my brothers and sisters, not only do we need revival, we need reformation. When we come in contact with Jesus, we cannot remain the same if we've truly met Jesus. The Bible says that any man who is in Christ, he is a new creature. A what creature? Old things are passed away. That signifies change. Old things are passed away and all things become new. When a man is in Christ, a change takes place. And when a man says that he's had contact with Christ, but he still looks the same and talks the same and dressed the same and acts the same, that man proves that he's never met Jesus. You see, when we come in contact with Jesus, we must experience both revival and reformation. And my friends, this is what we need in this last hour. You see, all over this world, Jesus is getting the people ready to meet him. And it's not going to be everybody. But the Bible says that there's going to be a remnant that is going to be ready to meet Jesus. And you and I have the distinct privilege of being a part of that holy group. In fact, we're going to study tonight into something that inspiration entitles the last act in the drama. Would you say that with me? The last act in the drama. I believe that's very significant. And I believe that we're told in inspiration that we can ask more on Jesus on the Sabbath than on any other day. And that Jesus will not allow the Sabbath to go by before that request is answered. Oh, my friends, I say we should lift our prayers up to Jesus tonight. We should be pleading for the outpouring of his spirit. We should be pleading for salvation, not only ourselves, but the salvation of our families. If you have never given your heart to Jesus, you need to do it tonight. If you've given your heart to Jesus and have taken it back, you need to give it back to Jesus tonight. Everything we have needs to be put on the altar. I'm going to show you in the course of tonight and tomorrow that I believe that upon the authority of the Bible that we're living in the last few months of this earth's history. And the majority of us, we're not ready for this issue. And we need to be praying. I'm pleading with God that he'll give us just a few more years. Are you praying that? You see, my friends, when you understand how serious the crisis is, and you understand how near we are and how unprepared we are, you will be pleading with God, give us just a few more years. I'm pleading for that. Because in the natural order of things, my friends, we have but a few short months. And the majority of the world, they believe that everything is going all right. I hope you don't believe that. I hope that upon the authority of your Bible, you're saying, Lord, get me ready like I've never been getting gotten ready before. We need to pray like we've never prayed before. 
We need to study the Bible like we've never studied before. And we need to get our homes ready for what's soon to break upon this world as an overwhelming surprise. And so before we get into that message this evening, the last act in the drama, I want to ask that you might reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer. We want to spend a few moments just silently petitioning the God of heaven that he will open up our hearts to the what God wants to speak to us tonight. And then after a few moments of silently praying, I'll close out out loud from up front. and We'll get into the message, the last act in the drama. Oh, Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for the love that is in thy sacred heart. I'm so thankful, Lord, that when we went astray, the only world in the universe, that you did not give up on us, but that you sent your Son to redeem us. I pray, Father, that the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit may take control of this assembly. I pray that we might sense that we're in heavenly places, that we might feel the urgency of the hour, that the sluggish heart may be energized by the invigorating spirit of heaven, that our sleepy and tired frames may be revived, that our hearts, Lord, may be convicted and converted of our need of giving all to Jesus. Father, I pray that heaven will come so close to us tonight. I pray that you will close the talking mouth, that you will gather the straying mind, and that you will allow angels to walk up and down in this assembly, that we might remember what it means to be in the presence of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you will take possession of this weak frame, this poor vessel, and that you will magnify thy name and thy truth in this last hour. Oh, Father, show us what it means to approach the last act in the drama, and that we might understand the need of preparation before it is everlasting too late. Now and abide with us, we pray. We pray for the outpouring of your spirit in latter rain proportion. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Soldiers of the cross, every round goes higher and higher. Would you sing it with me? Every round goes higher and higher. Every Soldiers of the cross. Heavenly Father, as we've opened your word, we pray that you will take us higher than we've ever been and that your sweet spirit would rest in this place, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, to the last book of the Bible, to the book of Revelation. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Now, brothers and sisters, you know that I like to see Bibles, amen? In fact, if you have a Bible, just raise them up high so that I can see that you have a Bible. We like to see churches with Bibles. You see, my friends, we cannot experience a revival and reformation. We cannot be ready for the crisis that's going to, going to take place unless we come back to the Bible. And the Bible says in Revelation 12, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Now, my friends, it's interesting that I found that as I travel from place to place, that we live in a generation where it has become fashionable for men and women to come to church without Bibles. But my friends, it's important that we see the Bible for ourselves. We need to see with our own eyes what we're going to study tonight and tomorrow. We need to know for ourselves that what we believe is not based on the opinions of a man. It's not based on the ideas of a church that everything we believe should be based where? Upon the words of Jesus. If you do not have a Bible, I ask that you do not rest satisfied with not having a Bible. I pray that you sit next to someone who does. I pray that you bring a pen and a paper so that everything that we see tonight and believe tonight is based not on what we've heard said, but that we can read from our own Bibles what God has said to us. Do you know that we're told that in the last great delusion that's getting ready to take place, that Satan is going to pretend to be Jesus, that he's going to come and counterfeit the coming of Christ. And we're told in the great controversy that so closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. That by their testimony that every miracle and every statement must be tested and we must become familiar with this book right now. You see, my friends, we're told as you study the Bible that the great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is about to end. The great destiny of souls is going to be decided. The teeming multitudes of this world are going to see a great dividing line take place and we are going to have to make a decision. And right now we're approaching what the Bible calls the last act in the drama. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation 12, beginning in verse 7, are you there, amen? In verse 7, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, and there was what? War in heaven. Now, in order to understand the last act in the drama, we must first understand the first act in the drama. You see, my friends, the Bible says that what we see in the great controversy is just like something called the great drama of the ages. You know, in the drama, they have acts and plays and scenes, and everything must take place just as the script says. When you have a drama and a play, and every act goes by, and every person acts their part in a play, they cannot do what they want to do. They must do what the script says. Am I right or wrong? And the Bible compares what we see today into a big drama of the ages. We call it the great controversy, but inspiration calls it the great drama of the ages, and our destiny is connected with the last act in the drama. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that our salvation is dependent upon us understanding this, and the majority of the world do not even understand the first, let alone the last. And in the last generation, we're not approaching the first. In the last generation, we have come face to face with the last act in the drama. But in order to understand the last act, we must begin by understanding the, the first act. And the first act did not start on earth. The first act started, guess where? In heaven. What is the first act in the drama? The Bible says in verse 7. The Bible says beginning in verse 7. Let's read that together. The Bible says, and there was what? War in heaven. In heaven, war, yes. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And, and, and the dragon and, and his angels fought, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore where? In heaven. 
Now, brothers and sisters, this is going to take for earnest study for us to study this. But as we put these pieces together, we are going to understand exactly where we are in the great drama of the ages because when the last act takes place, we cannot get ready for that crisis. When the act, last act takes place, we must be ready for the crisis. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says that the first act was war where? In heaven. Now, I want to ask you a question. What was the war about in heaven? What was it about? Somebody said God's character. Now, you know that if you study with me long enough, that the next question I'm going to ask if I ask you a question is what text is that in the Bible? Amen? Because everything we believe should be based where? On the Bible. You see, there's a lot of things that we believe that are not in the Bible. Did you know that? You remember, I'll never forget hearing about when man would tell me they would talk about the ostrich, and when the ostrich gets scared, you know what the ostrich does? He puts his head where? Now, my brothers and sisters, where did you read that that takes place? Do you know that doesn't take place? Do you know that if you look in the encyclopedia and you look up an ostrich and you look up the, 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 character, the character characteristics of an ostrich, an ostrich does not literally put his head in the ground. It is a mythology that has been used and we have watched so much cartoons until we believe more in what television says than what really takes place. Ostrich don't do that. But my brothers and my sisters, many things today is just like that. When we say things, the only way that we can be sure about that thing is that we must find it where? In the Bible. So when we ask, what was this war about? Because believe me, we cannot understand the end of the war if we don't understand the beginning of this war. Now, my brothers and sisters, I ask you a question. My question is, what in the world was this war about? Because we would think, how in the world, if Jesus is in heaven, how could there be war in heaven? We believe that if Jesus was on earth, it would stop all war. But my friends, there's something worse than war. And the Bible says that until this thing is solved, there will continue to be war. Now, my friends, what is this war about? Do you know what is this war about? What did you say? Satan wanted to be like the Most High. What does the Bible say? Look at what the Bible says. Verse 7. Look at what the Bible says. Revelation 12, 7. The Bible says, and there was what? War in heaven. Let's notice if we can see what it's about. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, what for? Verse 8. The Bible says, and prevailed not, neither was there what? Neither was there what? Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. They were fighting over a particular, what does the Bible say? Place. This war in heaven was over a place or a position. Now, my friends, we're not talking about geography. We're not talking about simply location. You'll remember that when you study the book of Isaiah chapter to 14 that the Bible speaks of Lucifer and he speaks of Satan and it said in his heart what was Satan looking for he said I wanted to ascend where into the heights of heaven I want to exalt my throne above the stars of God I want to sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north the Bible says he wanted the position of God he wanted the place of God. Now, my brothers and my sisters, Jesus could not give him his position or his place. Satan was not satisfied with his position and place. He aspired to a place that a creature can never feel. My friends, do you know that that caused war in heaven? And do you know that today man is seeking for a place that man cannot feel? And we're told that this same spirit of Satan is being carried out today. But it's interesting that Satan has been more effective in taking the place of God more on earth than he has been in heaven. Did you know that? You know what Satan wants? Satan wants the place of God. If we had time to study it, we would understand that when Satan said he wanted to sit in the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. Do you know that when you study the Bible, that in the sides of the north was where God's city was? Do you know that when you study the Bible, that, that, that there was a particular place that the throne of God set, and when he said he wanted his throne to sit there, his desire was to take the place of God. My friends, that's the spirit of Antichrist. We are told that that spirit has not been there. And while he was kicked out of heaven, that same desire of Satan has been carried down to this earth. 
And you know what place he wants? You see, God wants your time and your attention. God wants your affection and your authority and your worship. And do you know that Satan wants that place in your life? And many of us on this earth, we give Satan that which should be given to the place of God. You know that in many of our homes, we have it set up like a shrine. And you know what the center of the object, the object is in our homes? The television. You know, if you were to set up an altar, and if you were to watch when they set up these altars and these graven images, they would set everything in the temple to surround the God in which they worship. But when you walk into the majority of houses today and you walk into the living room, you know what the center of attention is? It's not the Bible. It's not Jesus. The center of attention, the place that should be occupied by God is occupied by a modern graven image that we call a television. And man will watch the images there instead of watching the sweet face of Jesus. And my friends, if we give more time to the things of this world than we give to God, those things are taking the place that God should be in. Is that true? And if the Bible gets less time than the television, if the cell phone gets more time than our time on our knees talking with God, these things have become our gods, and we cannot be ready to meet Jesus unless Jesus has the first place in our lives. My friends, we're told in the Bible, we're told in the Bible in Revelation that this is the very thing that Satan wanted. He wanted the place of God, not simply location, but he wanted the affection and the worship that belongs first and foremost to God himself. And Satan sought to take that place. But I want to ask you a question. Why is it that God deserves worship and not Satan? Why do you think that is? Is it right or wrong? Is it wrong to give Satan worship? Why is it that it's wrong to give Satan worship? Because the devil says, God is selfish. God wants worship. How come I can't get worship? You, you see, some people say, well, because God is more powerful than us, that's why we worship him. But is Satan more powerful than us? Somebody says, well, God is smarter than us. That's why we worship us, but, uh, him. But, but is Satan smarter than us? What is it that makes it right for us to give worship to God and wrong for us to give worship to Satan? Why is it that Satan should not have the place of God? This is what the great controversy is all about. What did you say? There is because he's our creator. Now, what text is that in the Bible? Now, we need to understand this from the Bible. Is that right? You see, we have to study line upon line so that the Bible explains itself. In fact, notice what the Bible says in the book of Revelation. What book did I say? Revelation chapter 4. We'll come right back to Revelation 12. In Revelation chapter 4, I want you to notice what the Bible says. And do you know that adults used to understand this? Fathers used to understand this, that we owe God worship because of his position. You see, the father, he does not have to buy the respect of his children. When a father walks into his home, if he says to his children, do this or do that, they should do it by nature of his position of being the father. Is that right? But my brothers and sisters, we live in a generation today where we see fathers have yielded up that authority and now children are running homes more than the adults. You don't believe me? Go down to your local grocery store. And you see that child. The child says, I want this. The mother and father said, no. The child says, give me that and starts trying. And instead of the child being brought into submission, the adults are brought into submission. My, father, my brothers and sisters, we live in a messed up generation. And we see that this is a sign that we're living in the last days. But a father, by nature of the fact that he's the father, in fact, we used to say this, or it used to be said almost a generation ago, that if I brought you into the world, I can. That is virtue of position. Authority, father, brought child into the world. As a result, we're to honor father and mother. And the Bible says, because God brought us into the world, we owe him reverence and respect and worship. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation 4, Revelation 4, beginning in verse 11, notice what the Bible says. Beginning in verse 11, let's read that together. The Bible says, thou art what? Thou art worthy. Let's notice why. He's worthy of worship. He's worthy of reverence. He's worthy of respect. Why is God worthy and not the devil? The Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For thou hast what? 
created what? All things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created by virtue of his position as our creator, our father who has brought us into existence, the sustainer of life, we owe him reverence and respect and authority. And when we do not give what belongs to Satan, do you know that we are in rebellion against the God of heaven? My brothers and my sisters, when you study through the book of Revelation, Satan did not want this understanding to be known. And so he made the object of his attack to be the law of God. You know why he hates the law of God? The law of God fixes and establishes the distinction between the creature and the creator. And because of this, Satan hates it. Think about it. What does the law say? The law says, thou shall have what? No other gods before me, the creator. In other words, no other person deserves that place. The law says, thou shall not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shall not bow down thyself, nor what? serve them. And so if Satan is going to take the place of God the Creator, he must attack and destroy the law of God. Do you see? The law says in the first four precepts, our duty to God and our duty to our fellow creatures. And the fourth commandment says, remember the seventh day to, remember the Sabbath day to keep it. Six days and I'll do all thy work. But the seventh day is the then it goes on to say, it says, for in six days he made heaven and earth and sea, and so the everlasting gospel says, worship him that made heaven and earth and sea. We see that if Satan is going to get our worship, he must destroy that which establishes the distinction between the creature and the created, and so he must destroy the law of God. My friends, it's ever been Satan's policy from the war in heaven, his whole goal has been to overthrow this law. In fact, the Bible says in verse 17 of Revelation 12, what book did I say? In Revelation 12, verse 17, notice what the Bible says. Let's read that together. In Revelation 12, verse 17, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, and the dragon, who's that? Well, that's the devil. The Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which do what? Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This war that started in heaven did not end at the beginning of time. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 17 that that war is still taking place. The Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed and the issue of this war at the end of time is the same issue that began at the beginning of time it all centered around the law of God and the position of God as our creator and Satan must destroy this law of God but my question tonight is how is Satan going to do this because do you know that the world is deceived right now upon this issue the popular churches they believe that the law has been nailed to the cross the majority of the world believe that those ten precepts of the Decalogue are a dead letter and should be thrown away. And there's only one church that has been given the light from heaven that reveals to us the issue in this last hour. And the majority of those in that church, they're sleeping. We have no clue of what's taking place. And do you know that if you read the script, everything is happening just as God says, Oh, I want to run ahead of myself. Because right now there's something that's taking place in the presidential administration. There's something that is taking place over there by the Pope of Rome. There's something that's going on in the world today that indicates that we're living in the last few months of this earth's history. And instead of God's people getting ready, the majority of us, we would rather go to sleep somewhere than get our lives right with Jesus. My friends, listen to me. Every one of us are going to have an opportunity if we take it now. But if we're lost, we're going to have no excuse in the judgment. God in mercy has brought these meetings to this church at this time because he loves us. He wants to give us an opportunity to make things right before it is too late because I promise you, we don't have long. We're going to prove that. We're going to prove by the authority of the Word of God that this first act in the drama that started over 6,000 years ago is almost over. 
and the last act we are approaching it today at breathtaking speed this last act that brings and brings us to view with the seal of God and the mark of the beast in fact my brothers and my sisters the Bible says very clearly in Revelation chapter 12 the Bible says that Satan is upset and he's making war with the people of God and the Bible says my brothers and my sisters beginning in the book of Isaiah what book did I say in Isaiah chapter 14, I want you to notice something. In the book of Isaiah 14, I want you to notice something. In fact, before we go there, go to Daniel chapter 7. And my question right now is, what is Satan doing to destroy the law? We know that he's attacking the law, but how is Satan going to attack and destroy this law? Because there are two main ways to do this. You see, my friends, Satan can make the world believe that the whole law is nailed to the cross. He's doing that. But we're told that whether Satan attacks the law, the whole Ten Commandment law, or whether he gets man to disregard one precept, the result is still the same. For the Bible says in James 2 verse 10, that if man offend in one point of the law, he's guilty of how much? That if man breaks one point of the law, he's broken how much of the law? The whole law is so holy that to break one of his sacred precepts is to break the entire Decalogue and Satan does not care whether he makes you believe that the whole law has been nailed to the cross or whether he makes you believe that the law of God has been changed and this is what he's done to the world today the Bible says in Daniel 7 and Daniel 7 beginning in verse 25 and when you get there let me know by saying amen in Daniel 7 verse 25 the Bible tells us what Satan is going to do and verses 25 the Bible says and he shall do what he shall speak great words against the Most High, speaking of that Antichrist power, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Now, some people may not understand what that says, but I remember, I don't know if they say today, but I remember that, that if we got in trouble years ago, my parent would say, we're going to wear you out if you don't say, act right. That wearing out means to persecute. The Bible says, and this is what Satan is going to do. The Bible says, he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And think to do what? To change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time and times and a divine of time. We don't have to guess at the attack. We have the script. And the script says that how Satan is going to attack the law is that he's going to think to change what? Now, do you know what that means? When it says times and laws, you actually means time laws. And there's only one law in the Ten Commandments that has to do with time. What, what, what law is that? That's the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment that says that, 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 that God made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. And this is the only law that has to do with time. And do you know that there are many sincere Christians that do not know how and why the law has been changed? I remember just a few weeks ago, we were out of the country doing some meetings. And there was a person that came up. They were not Seventh-day Adventists. They had not known about this group of people, this church, but they had begun to recognize that the Sabbath had been changed. And the young man and his wife came to my wife and I in the meetings that we were doing, explaining this. And they said, Al, we have found that the seventh day is the Sabbath, and their whole church is trying to learn about the seven-day Sabbath. Now, my brothers and sisters, it's amazing that while the Seventh-day Adventists take Sabbath lightly, that there are others that are getting ready to learn this message, and our crown, some of them, are going to be taken. You see, while we are not serious about salvation, do you know that God has sheep and other church that are longing for this truth? And we're told that this church is going to be shaken, my friends, because the majority of true Christians are not in the Seventh-day Adventist church. The majority of true Christians are in the other churches that know nothing of this truth, while the majority of those that know nothing about Jesus fill up these pews and believe that just because we're Seventh-day Adventists that we have a right to salvation. My friends, our denomination will not save us. Unless we know Jesus for ourselves, we will not be ready for this last crisis. And this is why that God has sent a message to every nation and kindred and tongue and people so that you and I would have an opportunity to get things right with Jesus so that when the crisis breaks, we can be safely hid in Jesus Christ. 
Oh, I want to be ready. How about you? And so the Bible tells us exactly. And do you know, they did not know why the Sabbath had been changed. They, you know, there are people that say when they were kids, they used to read the Ten Commandments, and it said that the seventh day was the day we should worship on, and they would go to their parents and say, why do we go to church on Sunday? My brothers and sisters, many of you don't know why, but when I tell you this, you and I know this. I got this from the Roman Catholic Church. I have, a, I, I have a book right here called The Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. Not long ago, a Roman Catholic sent me one, and it was the updated one, and it says the same thing. And it's interesting that it was, a question was asked on this book, and this is what the Catholic Church uses to teach their church when you're baptized into the Catholic Church. This is what it uses to teach you what they believe. The question was asked, which is the Sabbath day? Notice what the Catholic Church says. Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Now, brothers and sisters, the Catholic Church is not hiding the fact that they know which day is the Sabbath. It says, question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church, did it say the Bible did this? Did it say God changed this? It says the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 364, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now, this is not an enemy of the Catholic Church that said that. This is not a member of the remnant church that said that. This is an actual quotation from the Catholic Church themselves that say that we change the day. They will tell you themselves that they are the power from Daniel 7.25, based on this. Because the Bible says that there will come a power that speaks against the Most High, that would think to change what? Times and laws. My brothers and sisters, this is exactly what's taking place. In fact, do you know that this change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday is the mark of the beast? We'll prove some of that tomorrow. But this says, Sunday is a Catholic institution. Does it say a Bible institution? You know, it's nowhere in the Bible. I'll never forget I was doing a series of meetings someplace, and I was going to uh, staying at the house of the man who owned the whole campgrounds. He was a Baptist minister, and he was a multimillionaire, and we were talking together, and one day as we started talking, he knew that I was a Sabbath keeper, and he brought up the conversation. He said, you go to church on the seventh day. Why do you go to church on the wrong day? And I said, well, I didn't bring it up. You brought it up, amen. I'm not afraid to talk about it. I said, now, I believe in the Bible. I said that if there was any other day that this Bible taught, I would believe it and teach it with all my heart because I believe not so much in what a man says and what a church says. I believe in what the Bible says. You see, a Christian, he lives by every word that proceedeth not out of the mouth of man. He doesn't live that way. A Christian lives like Jesus, and Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I said, now, there's one text in the Bible that says that I'll believe it and I'll accept it. The man said, he said, I'm a minister. He says, I know this in the Bible. I said, well, minister, my friend, you talk to me about it. Show me a text. I'll believe it. I said, in fact, I go all around the world and we offer tens of thousands of dollars for any man that can find one text that shows that Sunday is the Bible Sabbath or the Christian Sabbath or the Lord's Day, and it's not there. He said, oh, it's somewhere here. And he said, I'll find it. I said, show me that text. And he said, okay. He goes upstairs. He said, he's going to get the Bible text. Do you know he never came back down that night and never talked to me any more about it in the next few years when we had interaction together, never said anything more about the text. You know why? Because those texts are not in the Bible. The Bible says that this is not a man, a, Catholic, a, 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 a biblical position, as the Catholic Church says. Sunday is a what? Catholic institution. And its claim to be observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. Now, you may not understand that. When it says, now this is the Catholic Church talking, when they say it can only be defended on Catholic principles, what they mean is that a Catholic does not believe in the Protestant position. A Catholic puts tradition and the words of Pope above the Bible. If the Pope says it, it's above what the Bible says. 
If the church says it, it's above what the church says. That is a Catholic principle. A Protestant position is that the Bible must say it. Do you understand? And so the Catholic says that it is impossible to defend Sunday on a biblical position. It can only be defended on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of Scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of a weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Now, this is what the Catholic Church says themselves, and this is not hundreds of years ago. You know when this was? This was in the year 1990. From the press, they said, this cannot be defended. Sunday is a Catholic institution. And the Bible said that this would be Satan's attack on the law of God so that instead of giving worship to God, worship would be given to man in the place of God. Oh, my friends, we're going to be see that this is the last act in the drama. In fact, in the book of, uh, of the Testimonies for the Church, and volume 7 of the Testimonies. You heard of the Testimonies for the Church? You still believe those Testimonies? Volume 7, page 141. Listen to what this says. It says, more and more, the world is setting at naught the claims of God. Men have become bold in transgression. Isn't that not true today? Man is becoming more bold in sin. There used to be a time when sin sometimes would be hidden and covered, but not today. Man will sin in broad daylight. In fact, this says, men have become bold in transgression. The wickedness of the inhabitants of the world has almost filled up the measure of their iniquity. The earth, this earth, has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his will upon it. You see, God has been, check, been protecting America and the world, but something is going to happen to make God withdraw his protecting hand, and it says that it's almost to this place today. It says the substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in the place of the Bible Sabbath is what? Is the last act in the drama. Let's make sure we're together. What is the last act in the drama? The substitution of the laws of men for the law of God. The exaltation of, of, of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. Now, what was the first act in the drama? The first act in the drama was war in heaven. Is that right? We found out that the last act in the drama is what? The last act in the drama first, the Bible calls it the mark of the beast. The last act in the drama is called the mark of the beast. We found out that this substitution of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. Now, my brothers and sisters, most people don't understand what that means. You see, for a Seventh-day Adventist, this means something very serious. You see, to understand that Sunday is coming, that the last act in the drama is something that is called the National Sunday Law is very significant. It means something for us that is tied in to our eternal salvation. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, and volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 141, that the Sunday law is the last act in the drama. My question is, does the Bible say that? Or do you believe that the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy say something different? Does the Bible teach that? Because do you see right now, my friends, something is going to take place as a result of this. We are told that there are things that are going on in the world around us that Sunday is going to bring us to earth's last crisis. In fact, Jesus told us in the book of Matthew, what book did I say? In Matthew chapter 24, notice what the Bible says. You see, we're told that when Sunday comes, when the Sunday law is passed, that a great crisis is going to develop around us. And while men today are predicting that there's getting ready to be peace, and prosperity and safety, Jesus says, a storm is coming, my friends. It's not getting better. 
We are getting ready to see the, most great, the, the greatest crisis that men have ever been called to face. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24, notice what the Bible says. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Matthew 24, you remember the words of Jesus. He looked down to our day, and they asked Jesus the question, his closest disciples. In verses 3, the Bible says, let's read it together. The Bible says, and as he sat where? Upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came into him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of what? Of thy coming and of the end of the world. And Jesus gave them clear signs. And my friends, these signs that Jesus gave us, they are the script to the play. They are the part that everybody must act because this whole world, are like actors in a play. And it's amazing that everybody is playing out their part well. Did you know that? Do you know that when you understand what the play is, you understand scene by scene and act by act from the first act to the last act and the drama of the ages, you understand exactly what's going to take place. You understand exactly what's getting ready to happen. And when you see this, do you know we're told that as God's people, that we're going to have to learn in a few months what it has taken others years to learn. My friends, when we come tomorrow, we're going to have to study in a few short hours what it has taken others years to learn because we need to find out where are we in relation to this last act in the drama. Where are we in relation to the passing of this Sunday law? Because when the Sunday law is passed as Seventh-day Adventists, if we are not ready, we're lost. You see, the majority of the seven heaven church is being taught today that you have until Jesus comes to get ready. But do you know the Bible does not teach that? The Bible teaches that the last act in the drama is going to decide it for seven day Adventists. Now, there are going to be many Christians in the Sunday churches that are not going to be judged at that time. And the reason why is because that ignorance, God winks at it. You see, we are condemned because of the light we have. Many who are going to pass a Sunday law are good, sincere Christians that see the world in trouble and they want to bring the world back to God and they believe that the Sunday law is going to do it. But my friends, they don't understand that the Sunday law is the mark of the beast. They don't understand that. But as a seventh Adventist, with all of this light before us, if we transgress, we offend God, and we either receive the seal of God or the mark of the... Now tell me something. Can you receive the mark of the beast and then rub it off when you get home? No, you can't do that. You see, it is a eternal decision. And to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin, James 4, 17. And so, my friends, this last act in the drama becomes very serious to us. And do you know that we're not ready? Our homes, our schools, our churches are in trouble, even when I look at our young generation. You know that our young people, many of them are going to be the ones that finish the work, and we are not getting them ready like Daniel was. You see, my friends, listen to me, and I have to be honest with you. Veggie Tales and Sesame Street and all this, this is not going to get our children ready for what's coming. In order to get them ready, we must give them the Bible truth as God's parents gave to Daniel and the three boys. We must train them to stand during a crisis. My friends, we must take it very serious. We should start cutting off our televisions. We should start closing the doors of our homes and gathering our family and our friends and begin to pray like we've never prayed before. Begin to study like we've never studied before and say, family, it's time to get ready because we're not ready. It's time to surrender all before God so that when this last act takes place that we can be safe, hid with Christ in God, we could have made the preparation. My friends, this is what we must do. Because, my friends, as we notice what the Bible says, Jesus gave us signs to indicate how near we were to this last act in the drama. In Matthew 24, beginning. In verse 3, the Bible says that Jesus said, I'm going to tell you when the signs are going to be. And then he gave clear signs. Verse 4 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that how many? That no man deceive you. And brothers and sisters, we better believe that first. 
Because sometimes we think that just because we come into a church that we are, no, we are already safe from deception. If a man claims to be a teacher or an adult or a pastor or an evangelist, we must believe him. But my friends, we can't believe that. Satan will appear as an angel of light, and if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. And this is why I encourage you, don't even believe what I say. This is why I ask you to have your what? This is why you must have your Bibles and make sure that you understand for yourself, that you study to show yourself approved, because no man is safe from this deception unless he studies the Bible for himself. The Bible says to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Verse 5 goes on to say, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 6 says, And ye shall hear of what? Of wars and rumors of wars. We see these signs today. These signs are so normal that we have become desensitized by these signs. All of these signs that we call current events are events that are taking place all around us. And man today no longer sees the significance of this. But the Bible says there shall be wars and rumors of wars. Is this the end or only the beginning? The Bible says, notice what it says. You share wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall do what? Rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. I mean, just think of it. Just a few weeks ago, we saw this in Samoa. We saw this over there in the eastern part of the continent. We saw the earthquakes and the tsunamis and the cyclones. And man today does not understand what it means. Do you know that the world, they see all the hurricanes? They see the fires, they see the flood, they see the tornado, but it's almost like it was in the days of Daniel. You remember when that bloodless hand came into Daniel's court and the courts of Babylon? A bloodless hand came on the wall and it wrote on the corner of the wall, many, many tekel yepharsin, and the Babylonians could not understand it. And they had to bring in Daniel. And Daniel was made to interpret what it meant and he showed them that the greatest nation of that time was getting ready to come to an end. And my friend, do you know that today that God has called seven Adventists to do today what Daniel did back there? God has given us through the prophecies of Daniel and the revelation the ability to understand scene by scene, play by play, act by act, everything in this great controversy because the Bible says, surely God will do nothing but reveal his secrets unto his servants, the, his, the prophets, Amos 3, 7. And so, my brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us this is not the beginning. While man is looking for things to get better, the Bible says it's going to get worse. In fact, the Bible says in verses 8, in verses 8, notice what it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. In other words, the Bible is saying, you have not seen anything yet. Jesus said that it's going to be almost like in Daniel's day. Daniel said a time of trouble is coming that has never been since there was a nation. All of the problems we see today, all of the calamities, all of the atrocities that we've seen through time are going to pale into insignificance in comparison to what's coming. The Bible says we haven't seen anything yet. In fact, it goes on to say it's going to get much worse than this. And verse 9, the Bible says, Then shall they do what? Deliver you up to be afflicted. Matthew 24, verse 9. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. It says, And shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of how much? Of how much? Of all nations for my name's sake. Do you know that today? That man is afraid for one person to hate him. Man believes that if the church begins to hate him or some people in the church, that man is afraid to stand and believe what the Bible says based on the idea of what somebody will think about him. But the Bible says that if you're going to stand for Jesus in this last hour, that all nations are going to hate us and only one who loves Jesus more than anything else can go through this time. 
The Bible says you're going to be hated for all nations for my name's sake. Verse 10 says, and then shall what? Shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Do you know that the Bible says that mother is going to turn in their children? Mother will turn in her daughter. Father will turn in his son. Husband, if he's not converted, will turn in his wife. And this is why that our closest and best friend must always be Jesus. Because man can turn his back on us, but Jesus will never turn his back on us. My brothers and my sisters, this is why we're to draw so close to Jesus as never before as we approach this last act in the drama. The Bible says that no one is going to be able to be trusted, that we are going to be deceived by friends and acquaintances and foes. And in verse 12, it says, And because iniquity shall abound, what is going to be the result? Because iniquity shall abound, the Bible says, The love of many shall do what? And do you know this is taking place today? Man has never been at a time where man's love for his fellow man has never been as low as it is today. I was just reading the other day, just a few months ago, you know what happened? A girl had walked into a convenience store, and as she walked into the store, she got stabbed by somebody in the store and fell down. Blood coming out of her body. Four people in the convenience store walked over her body, and the fifth one took out his cell phone and took a picture of her while she was dying in a pool of blood. Man is losing a love for his fellow man. The love of man is waxing cold, and the Bible says it's getting worse and worse, so much so that the Bible says, notice what it says in the next verse. It says, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13 says, but he that shall do what? Shall endure unto the end. The same shall be saved. In other words, we are going to need an endurance to go through this time. No regular experience can take us through this crisis. We are going to need a physical and spiritual stamina that has not been attained by any preceding generation. We are going to need a physical and spiritual endurance that has not been experienced by any generation except for the last. My friends, what is going to give us this experience? What is going to give us the ability so that we can go through the last crisis of the ages? What must we have? Because if we're not ready for this crisis, the Bible says we're lost. It says, unless we endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. What do we need to go through this crisis? Next verse. What does the next verse say? The Bible says in the next verse, it gives us the answer. It says, and this what? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. In other words, it is only the gospel that can prepare us for the last act in the drama. It is only the gospel that can prepare us for the great events that is going to take place. For we're told that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation in Romans 1.16. If we don't have the gospel, we do not have the power of Jesus. The Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of Christ unto salvation. And unless we receive the gospel into our hearts and begin to live that gospel in our lives, we will never be ready for this great crisis. But that brings me to an important point. How do we know that we have this gospel? You see, there are hundreds of denominations today. There are many religious organizations all claiming to have this gospel. But when I say this gospel, does that mean any gospel or a specific gospel? That article, this, is very specific. If I say, in order to go through the last act of the drama, if I say, in order to be able to go through this crisis, I must have this book, can you have any book or must you have this book? Can you pick up any book in the room and be ready? If I say you must have this book to go through the crisis, you must have this book. This is very specific. And when the Bible says, and this gospel shall be preached in all the world, it is a very specific gospel, and it gives two identified marks. Notice what it says in Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in how much of the world? In all the world. For a witness 
unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Number one, it must be a worldwide gospel. How do I know? The Bible says, and this gospel shall be preached where? In all of the world. So if it's going to be preached in all of the world, the gospel must be a worldwide gospel that is going to prepare us for this crisis. Are you with me? Number one, this specific gospel that we need to prepare us, it must be worldwide. And number two, it must be an in time gospel. How do I know that? Verse 14 said, and this gospel, not only would it be preached into all the world, but it says, for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the, and if the end comes, it must be a what type of gospel? And in time gospel. So whatever this gospel is that is going to prepare us for this crisis, it must be worldwide and it must be an end time gospel. Now, my friends, where in the Bible do you think you would find this gospel? Where do you think you'll find that? Now, somebody says Revelation, but let me tell you something. To find it first in Revelation would not be the first intent because when Jesus said this, there was no New Testament. Am I right? When Jesus made this statement, the only Bible that was available was Matthew to Malachi, what we call the Old Testament. So there must be something in the Old Testament that brings to us the end time worldwide gospel that Jesus referred to. Where in the Bible where you, do you think we would find this? The next verse gives us the answer. Jesus tells us in verse 15, after talking about this gospel, he gives us a hint in verse 15 where we will find it. Verse 15 says, let's read that together. The Bible says, When ye therefore shall what? Now, do you have your Bibles? I don't hear you reading with me. Do you have your Bibles? Let's read it together. What does it say in verse 15? It says, When ye therefore shall what? Shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. When Jesus did this, he directed the attention of his hearers to the book of Daniel, my friends. Now, think of it. When men today speak of the gospel, we think of the gospel as it relates to Matthew and Mark and Luke. But when Jesus spoke of the gospel, he spoke of the gospel according to the prophet Daniel. And when we look at this, we should find in the book of Daniel a worldwide end time gospel. And in fact, go to the book of Daniel chapter 12. What book did I say? To the book of Daniel chapter 12. Notice what the Bible says. Daniel, the 12th chapter beginning, and the book of Daniel 12 beginning, and verse 9, notice what the Bible says, because in the book of Daniel, God revealed to us the end time worldwide gospel that brought to view this last act in the drama. It brought to view the work of preparation that we need in order to be prepared. In Daniel 12, verse 9, the Bible says, let's read that together. The Bible says, and he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are what? Closed up unsealed how long till the time of the end so this end time gospel was somewhere in the book of daniel but the bible says that daniel was closed up and and sealed how long till the time of the end and my friends do you know that what was sealed in daniel is unsealed in the book of revelation what was sealed and closed up in the book of Daniel, it is opened up and revealed in the book of Revelation. And so the gospel that was sealed in Daniel is unsealed and revealed in the book of Revelation. In fact, notice what the Bible says in Revelation 14. What book did I say? In Revelation, the 14th chapter, we see this gospel. And it makes sense. The book of Revelation, it deals with the last days. It deals with the end of time, and it makes sense for the last book of the Bible that deals with the end time to bring to view this end time worldwide gospel, and that's exactly what takes place. We're going to read in Revelation 14 in plain language. This gospel that was sealed in Daniel, but was unsealed and revealed in the book of Revelation, and Daniel and Revelation should be studied together. Am I right? One is a prophecy. 
The other is a revelation. One is a book sealed. The other is a book unsealed and revealed. Revelation 14, verse 6. Let's read it together. The Bible says, And I saw what? Another angel. What is he doing? Fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What did he have? What did the angel have? The everlasting gospel. Now remember now, Jesus said, And this gospel... It was sealed in Daniel, unsealed in Revelation. And there in the book of Revelation, this gospel by Jesus is called the everlasting gospel by the angel flying in the book of heaven in the Revelation. And if we don't understand this gospel, we're lost. And my brothers and sisters, we have two names now. The first name for this gospel was given by Jesus. He called it this gospel. But in the Revelation, we have another name. What's the next name for, the, for this gospel? The everlasting gospel. But tonight, I want to give you a third name before we bring out some final points. Tonight, I want to give you a third name. First, this gospel by Jesus. Then, everlasting gospel by the book of Revelation. But tonight, that, I want to give you another name called the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. What did I say? The three angels' messages. What was the first time this gospel was called by Jesus? It was called this gospel. What was the second name according to the book of Revelation? The everlasting gospel. And the third name that I'm suggesting now of the same message is called what? The three angels' message. And if this message is the same gospel that was referred to by Jesus unless we receive that message, we'll never be ready for the crisis. Because Jesus said, unless we endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 14 tells us that that what is going to give us the ability to endure is the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. But this gospel is very specific. It is very specific. It must be worldwide and an end time. And in Revelation 14, we see it. The book of Revelation deals with the end of time. Is it worldwide in Revelation 14, verse 6? It said the everlasting gospel would be preached to every nation. And if I preach to every nation, how much of the world does that include? The whole world. So if I preach to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, I'm looking at a worldwide end time gospel and the book of Revelation called the everlasting gospel. But my brothers and sisters, I call it now the three angels' messages. Where in the world would I get a funny name like that? Where in the world would I get a name that is so peculiar that we would call it a three angels' message? Because, my friends, there is no church in the world that understands this except for one that calls itself the remnant church. The three angels' messages, where would I get that name from? Does the Bible say three angels' message? Where does the Bible say three angels' message? You won't find those words like that. No, no, not concerning this message. So where in the world did it come from? Is it something that we made up, or is it biblical? Oh, it's biblical. Notice what it says. Revelation 14, verse 9. How do we get the idea of this everlasting gospel being the three angels' message? After introducing that first angel, verse, uh, in verse 6, verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and do what? And give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Verse 8 says, And there followed another angel. What did this angel say? Verse 8 says, He said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Why? Because she made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. But then verse 9, notice what it says. Verse 9 says, and the third angel. What is the numerical number? What type of angel? The third angel. Now, if this angel that warns against the beast, his image, his mark, is the third angel... Now, I want you to notice what it says. Verse 9. Let's read verse 9. Revelation 14, verse 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying, with a loud voice, If any man worship what? The beast and his image, and receive his mark, 
in his forehead or in his hand. Now, this is the third angel's message. It warns against three things. What are the three things? If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. Now, notice what it says in the first part of verse 9. It says, and the third angel did what? He did what? He followed them. In other words, there was somebody that came before the third angel. And the one before the third angel, we find him in verse 8. And if the third angel is in verse 9, then the one before him would be what in reference to numerical value? Would be the second angel. So the one that warns against the fall of Babylon is the second angel. And the one, notice what it says in verse 8. Verse 8 says, verse 8 says, and there follow what? So that means that there was an angel before him. And if he followed him, another angel, if this is the second angel, the one before him would be the? And so the everlasting gospel that is contained by these angels Another name for them is the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Now, my brothers and my sisters, this third angel is the theme of greatest importance. We don't have time tonight to study all three of those angels. But the third angel is the one that brings most strikingly to view the last act in the drama. What does the third angel warn against? Three things. What does it warn against? What does the third angel's message warn against? Three things. The worship of the beast. The worship of the first the beast. Then the image of the beast. And finally the, the mark of this beast. And so the third angel warns against the worship of the beast, his image, his mark. These three. Now, we found out that the mark of the beast, or Sunday worship, is not the first act in the drama. It is the last act in the drama. Now, how in the world do we get that from the Bible? Because, my brothers and sisters, all this lays the foundation. We're getting ready to close right now. Because once we understand that Sunday is the last act in the drama, we need to study the Bible and say, well, how near are we to this? If this is the last thing, because... In the Bible, the Bible proves that this is the last thing that's going to take place, the last thing that Satan is going to do to lock this world down. Now, where will we find that in the Bible? In Revelation 14, we find out that after it warns against the third angel, the very next event, after the issue of the seal and the mark of the beast, the very next event that we see transpire is in verse 14. Let's read verse 14 together. Revelation 14, verse 14, what does it say? It says... And I did what? And I looked. And behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a what? A golden crown, and in his hand a sharp... Who is this that's sitting on this cloud? The Bible says the Son of Man. This is Jesus. The Bible says on his head he has a golden crown. What is in his hand? A sharp sickle. What does a person do with a sickle? He reaps a harvest. Is that right? In fact, verse 15 tells us that. And verse 15, notice what it says. Verse 15 tells us the time. Verse 15 says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. Why? For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, my brothers and my sisters, I want you to make sure that you see this. First, we see the last act of the drama with the mark. This issue over the beast, his image, his mark, his seal. Now, my friends, after we see the issue over the mark, the very next event we see is the harvest. The what? Now, on your notes, you want to write that down. So the first thing we see, first, we see the issue over the last act in the drama, the mark of the beast. But after the issue of the mark, the next event that we see is the harvest. Is that right? First, the issue over the mark, then the harvest. Would you say that with me? First, the issue over the mark, then the... So first, the mark, then the... Now, that's very important. Oh, my brothers and sisters, because my question tonight is, what is the harvest? 
Because when we understand what the harvest is, we will understand in relationship where the mark of the beast fits on God's drama of the ages. In fact, the Bible does not leave us to guess about this. In the book of Matthew, what book did I say? In the book of Matthew chapter 13, the Bible explains itself. And I'm so glad that we don't have to make up what the Bible says. The Bible explains itself, and in the book of Matthew, line upon line and text upon text, the Bible explains it very clearly. Matthew 13, Jesus is giving this parable over the wheat and the tares, very familiar parable, parable over the harvest, and Jesus is interested in not simply vegetation. This was a parable about human, human beings. In the book of Matthew 13, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verses 37, beginning in verses 37, notice what the Bible says. The disciples did not understand this parable of the wheat and the tares, and so they said, Jesus, what does it mean? And in verses 37, Jesus explained it. Verse 37, the Bible says, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is who? That's the one that was sitting upon the cloud, having the golden crown upon his head, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Verse 38 says, The field is what? The world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. So when we look at harvest, we're not dealing with vegetation. We're not dealing with produce. We're dealing with people. Jesus is interested in the production of human souls that are ripe and ready for the harvest. And the Bible tells us what it is. It goes on to say that the, the, the tares are the children of the wicked one. But in verse 39, would you all read that with me? What does it say? The Bible says, The enemy that sold them is who? The devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be when? In the end of the world. And so the Bible is clear that the harvest represents what? Now, it doesn't sound like you have a Bible. You have a Bible with me? If you have a Bible, what does the Bible say? The harvest represents what? The end of the world. So this harvest then, in symbolic language, this harvest represents the end of the world. But we found out that first, the last act in the drama, the mark of the beast, and then the harvest. But if the harvest represents the end of the world, that means that first we would see the issue over the mark of the beast, his image, and that worship, and then the next great event after the mark of the beast would be the harvest or the end of the... That means then that the last act in the drama is this mark of the beast. The last thing that happens in this world before it comes to an end is this issue over the seal of God and the mark of the beast. And this mark of the beast, this Sunday law, this Sunday worship that is going to be established by law is the last thing that Satan is going to do. And when that takes place, my friends, you and I are going to have to be in a position that has never been experienced by any preceding generation. Do you know what it means to be ready to the, for the last act of the drama? Notice what the Bible says as we bring this message to a close. In the book of Colossians, what book did I say? In the book of Colossians chapter 1. Notice what the Bible says. In the book of Colossians chapter 1, I want to read this. I want to read this. In Colossians chapter 1, you will find this. You're going to Colossians 1. You will find this in the book Bible Commentary 7a. Page 420, what the Spirit of Prophecy says concerning what we just read in the Bible. It says, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the test for the people of God by which their what? Eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing His law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin 
and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. We are told that when the image is sent up and when the Sunday law is passed, that this is going to decide our eternal destiny. And the reality is that we're going to prove tomorrow that we only have a few short months to a few short years before the national Sunday law is passed and God has given us every sign so that we may be aware of what is taking place. But instead of a church that has been watching the signs, most of us don't even know what the signs are. We don't even know what to look for. We don't even know when it's taking place in front of us what it means. And this is why God and love and mercy has sent this everlasting gospel to every nation and kindred and tongue and people to show us exactly what is going to take place before it transpires. And do you know, my friends, the world, the world is right now calling and crying for these sunny laws. Do you know that right now today that over in Croatia, they already have a law where Sunday buying is, is barred on the, on the first day of the week in Croatia today. A Sunday law is on the book of Croatia. Right now, and it says that the Pope in Austria says that Sunday must be protected as a day of what? As a day of worship. There are cries coming all across the world. And I'm going to show you, my brothers and sisters. I was at one church. And one young man said, as we were talking, that if the Sunday law were really getting ready to take place, would it not be in all of the newspapers? And I took out the newspaper and said, well, which one do you want to see then? Do you know that in every place of this world, in every form of media, and everything that's taking place, God is showing us that there is getting ready to be a push for a Sunday law like we've never seen before. And do you know that God has given us the ability to understand this whole drama of the ages? In fact, notice what it says. This came from a Time magazine of August 2nd, 2004. And on the front of it, it says, and on the seventh day we rested. Maybe those what? Old blue laws weren't so crazy after all. They're saying maybe the Sunday laws that used to be in vogue in America, maybe they weren't so crazy. Now when you read it, it goes on to say that in once upon a time, in the dominion of the new heaven, it was illegal to kiss your children on Sunday. It says, or make a bed, or cut your hair, or eat mince pies, or cross a river, unless you were a clergyman riding your circuit. If you lived in Connecticut in the 1650s, there was no mistaking Sunday for just another shopping day, regardless of whether you would go to hell for breaking the Sabbath, it says you would certainly go to jail. They said maybe those Sunday laws weren't so crazy. Do you know that right now, all across the world, they are asking for this? I'm going to show you. So where the Pope of Rome and even in America, all over the different states, that right now today that there is an event that has transpired and are getting ready to take place that is going to cause the entire nation to scream out and beg for a change of a day of worship. And this is why God has told us that whatever we do, we must do quickly. Because the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verses 26, let's read it together. In Colossians 1, verse 26, the Bible says, Even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. Verse 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of what? The glory. Colossians 1, 27. The glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ where? In you, the hope of glory. And my brothers and my sisters, our only hope of being ready for the last act in the drama, this Sunday law, is to have Christ not knocking at the door of our hearts. No man will be ready like that. The only way to be ready for this last act in the drama is that Christ must be in us the hope of glory. My friends, when that Sunday law is passed, he must not be partially in us. He must not be a little bit in us. He must be completely in possession of our minds and hearts and lives. Because, my friends, the Sunday law is just like a squeeze. You ever seen a sponge before? You take a sponge 
and you put a sponge and grape juice and you squeeze it, what comes out? Grape juice. You take that same sponge and you put it in an, in an orange juice and, and you squeeze it, what comes out? Orange juice. You take that same sponge and you put it in water and you squeeze it, what comes out? Whatever is in the sponge comes out. You and I are just like sponges. The Sunday law is the squeeze. And whatever is in us, when the Sunday law is passed, that is what is going to come out of us. And if Christ is not in us by the passing of the Sunday law, Christ cannot come out of us. And my brothers and my sisters, too often, God allows tests to take place that proves that Christ is not in us. You know, when someone cuts us off on the road and something comes out of our mouth or in our minds that should not be, it just shows us that Christ is not really in us. When we're in school or work and play and something comes out of us that is not Jesus, whether it's in our motives, whether it's in our thoughts, whether it's in our words, whether it's in our actions, if we manifest any spirit other than the spirit of Jesus, it just shows us what's really in our hearts. My friends, listen to me. If husbands and wives are still fighting and fussing, you think that they have Jesus in their heart. If children are still loving the world and television and adults, the world and television, more than their Bibles and prayer, do you really think that Jesus is in our hearts? And when that sunny law is passed, my friends, our only hope is to have Christ in us, not partially, but completely, fully, so that every thought we think, every word we say, Every motive and action of our life is nothing more than a manifestation of Jesus Christ. And then we'll be ready for the seal of God. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, if ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. I'll never forget that reading a story of a young man. And he had long, been, been longing to go to school. And because this young man had never been to school before, his great desire was to be there for the first day of class. He was excited about going to school for the first time. And his mother told him, you know, it's going to be different than when you were at home, son. You got to get up early. You have to get ready for school. And all of a sudden, the summer, summer seemed like it would never go by. Summer took so long, he was longing and loving and wanting to go to school. And all of a sudden, he comes to the last day. He's trying for that day to go by. It was almost like Christmas morning for some people. You know, on Christmas morning, some people find it hard to go to sleep the day before. This young boy couldn't go to sleep. He wanted to go to school. He was so excited. And so he starts playing outside. Is it time yet? His mother says, no, you still have another night. And he's just playing and playing. Finally, he comes back in. He eats his dinner. He says, it's almost time. And his mother says, you better go to sleep because it's getting late, son. You better go to sleep. The son says, oh, oh, it's almost there. It's all right. I'll be okay. But he keeps watching television. His mother goes to sleep believing that her son has gone to bed. But his son has snuck out and was just watching the cartoons and the late night shows and the movies. And he fell asleep watching television. The next morning, he woke up to the sound of an alarm that was blaring. And, and, and he wakes up. He didn't recognize that his mother had been trying to wake him up for a time and time, but he had overslept, and his mother said, you're late for school, the bus is coming, and you're almost going to miss the bus, you must get up. That boy rushed up, and he, he didn't even have enough time to sit down and eat his breakfast. He had to grab a, a, a biscuit and something on the way out the door, and as he's running out the door, he puts on his coat, and he's running to school. And he gets to the bus stop. And when he gets to the bus stop, he gets there just in time to see a bus leaving. But the dusty road was so much that he could not see the name of the bus, and he was not sure if it was his bus. And there was a little bench there, and the old man was sitting on the bench, and the young boy walked up to the old bench, and he said, Old man, old man, I didn't get a chance to see the name of that bus. Was that my bus? My memory is such and such. The old man said, as he looked at the boy, yes, that was the number. And the little boy put his head down. And the old man, as he was sitting there, looked at the young boy and he said, You know, you were running fast, young man, but if you just ran a little faster, if you just ran a little faster, you could have made it on board that bus. And the young boy looked up at the old man with a little solemn look and he said, No. He said, No, I shouldn't have run faster. He said, If only I had started much earlier, he would have been ready. My friend tonight, 
If we're going to get ready, it's not because when the Sunday law is passed, we're going to rush and try to get things right. We will never be ready by trying to get ready at the passing of a Sunday law. If we're ever going to get ready, we cannot wait. We have just enough time to start tonight, right now. And I'm going to prove that tomorrow. Oh, my friends, if ever there was a time when we wanted to make sure we knew Jesus, that time is now. Is there someone tonight that says, Lord, I want to be ready. I want Jesus in my heart and in my home so that when the last act takes place, when that study law is passed, that Christ will be in me and the only thing that will come out of me is Jesus Christ. Oh, my friends, let's get ready like never before. If that's your desire, would you reverently kneel with me as we close tonight? Oh, Father, we're so thankful that the Bible is clear, that the war in heaven was the first act of the drama. The great controversy started there, but, Lord, in this last generation, we're approaching the last act. Satan wants the place and the position in our hearts and lives that belong to Jesus. And to do this, he must destroy the law of God and change it by seeking to change the Sabbath commandment. He wants to pass a Sunday law, Lord. We are told that when this Sunday law takes place, that as Seventh-day Adventists, our opportunity for preparation will have come to an end. And Father, you've given us the prophecies. You've given us the script that the great drama of the ages is following by. And Father, we're in the last act. We're getting ready to see the Sunday law pass, and we don't have to guess at anything. And Father, we're living just a few short months before this takes place. We've only laid a foundation tonight, but tomorrow when we come together, we pray that you will show us clearly that we have but a little time and a great work to accomplish in that time. And the greatest work that can be done is to allow Jesus to take full possession of our hearts and of our homes. Be with every kneeling soul tonight. Lord, may an urgency be placed upon our hearts that if we've never given our heart to Jesus, we'll do it tonight, old or young. And then in our homes, Lord, that we will make a decision that there's going to be a difference, a change, so that when the Sunday law is passed, that when the crisis breaks, that every one of us will be ready to meet Jesus. And so we thank you for this. Be with every kneeling soul. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, as we leave this place, I want to leave you with a thought. You know that when popes choose their names, you know that the pope today, his, his present name is Benedict the Sixteenth. You tell me, is that his real name, Benedict the Sixteenth? What is his real name? Joseph Ratzinger. But do you know that we're told that when popes just before they take the position of a pope, that they have to go up into a conclave and they begin to kneel down and they begin to meditate until a specific name is given them that characterizes their pontificate. And when Joseph Ratzinger was kneeling down, he said with his own lips, I read it, he said it with his own lips. He said as he was praying that the Spirit gave him a name. And it wasn't the Holy Spirit, but it was a spirit. And my friend, it said it gave him a name. And he said the name that was given to him was Benedict the 16th. Now we know that the first part of benediction is what? Benedict. Now in a benediction, does that take place at the end of a program or the beginning of a program? And the benediction is the Benedict Pope. And my friends, this name characterizes pontificate. I'm telling you, we're going to prove that this is the Pope of the end. We're going to prove, my friends, tomorrow that everything that God says is taking place and the only thing that is unready is the people of God. But tonight, if we will open up our hearts to Jesus, we can be ready. What do you say? Let's pray for one another. Amen. Let's come on time. Let's bring Bibles. Let's bring pen and paper. And let's come tomorrow morning at Sabbath school and let's come ready to study like we've never studied before. What do you say? May God bless you. You may consider yourself... Dismissed.